After working as an engineer in the United States, he and his wife Cindy spent 15 years serving the Lord full time in Ethiopia, serving under SIM. In 2006, he joined our faculty here at DTS, where he now serves as department chair and professor in the pastoral ministries department. Vic is always looking for ways to integrate cross-cultural concerns with theological education, and he returns annually to Ethiopia each summer with graduate students to immerse them in a cross-cultural ministry experience. He's also active here at home in his own local church at Centerpoint in Mesquite, where he speaks several times a year, and as well as in churches and conferences around the country. His passion is to communicate biblical truth clearly across cultures and help others learn to do the same. He's married to his wife, Cindy, and they recently celebrated 35 years of marriage. And they have two uh, young adults in college, Julie and Philip, whom they adopted while serving in Ethiopia. And they're also caring for uh, aging parents. Uh, this gives them ample opportunity, what they say, to learn practical theology. <laughs> Vic, welcome to our chapel this morning. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Vic Anderson? I'm glad you cannot see me when I first wake up in the morning. For, you see, I, my hand reaches over to the phone that's alarming me that morning has come. My feet slowly go, go out of the edge of the bed and my legs unfold like a rusty accordion. My eyes like slits and the top of my head let in just enough light that I can stagger my way toward the stairway. I stumble down the steps. No brain activity is yet happening. I make my way to the coffee grinder and mindlessly, slowly grind that first cup of coffee. That's my usual pattern. But a couple of months ago, the way I woke was much different. For you see, in the middle of the night, I was startled to full alertness when my alarm, my security system, bah, 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 just put me into hypersensitivity mode. I vaulted out of bed, my legs springing under me. I ran down the steps, making Usain Bolt jealous. <laughs> My mind was suddenly processing thousands of thoughts as I recognized that the, door of our, the front door of our house was wide open and the wind was blowing in. And I thought, who's come in? And I was all ready and alert to respond to this warning. In fact, I thought, no one's going to come in and take my wife's life, take my life. I was in protection mode. I didn't want to lose our lives. <laughs> I really responded to that warning. I wish I responded so quickly to God's warnings. I find that when God warns me, I'm a little more likely to turn over and go back to sleep. Maybe that's true for you as well. This morning I want to suggest to you that God gives us a warning from his word that ought to vault us into hypersensitivity, to spring us into action because the warning is so severe. What kind of warning would do that, you might ask? It's this, that in your spiritual life, in your ministry life, you could lose the powerful presence of God. That in our lives, whether as individuals or as people involved in ministry, we could lose the powerful presence of God. Seems almost unthinkable that such a thing could happen. I mean, you know, Jesus said, I'm always with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? And besides, we're, we're DTS people. I mean, we, we're students of the word and we're followers of Jesus and we can't lose the presence of God. And out there, we are ministers to God's people, and we lead others in prayer and worship, and we can't lose the presence of God. Or 
Can we? I'm not talking here about issues of eternal security. I'm not talking about whether or not God saves us. But talking about whether or not God might turn a cold shoulder toward us. And we lose a sense of that intimacy, that presence. How is it possible that we might lose the very presence of God? Uh, Perhaps a better question is how do we keep from losing that powerful presence? What can we do to preserve the blessing of God's powerful presence in our lives? We're going to find this morning a a story, a, a tragic story from the life of God's people in the Old Testament. A sad story when indeed they did lose the presence of God. And from that story will emerge a warning, an alarm that screams out to us to take action. And having looked at the story and and the warning, we'll look at our own response to that warning and what it is that God would have us to do. The story occurred back when Israel was living in the time of the judges. It's actually recorded in the book of 1 Samuel when Eli was one of the judges. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4, we're going to find that to defeat, the Israel, to defeat the Philistines, the Israelites called for the powerful presence of God. That's how the story begins. They were in need of God's presence to intervene to bring them victory. And so they're going to call for it. First Samuel chapter 4, we'll be looking, uh, first of all, at the last half of verse 1. Look at the first three verses with me. First Samuel 4, 1 says this. Now, the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped there at Ebenezer, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Israelites. Catch the language here. Why did did the Lord bring defeat on us? They know something is up. You've got the scene, right? So Israel has gone out to the northwestern part of the land in order to fight against the Philistines. And they're expecting victory because this is exactly what Israelites are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to be removing the foreigners from the land. They're going against the Philistines who are camped at Aphek, and the Philistines bring the battle to them. And I suspect that Israel is quite certain that because they are obeying the Lord and because they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, that they're going to have victory. And they don't. So now this great question comes to the foreground. Why has the Lord defeated us? What are they going to do? How do you solve this dilemma? They have an idea. They get a committee together. Let's see what they decide. Chapter, we're back in verse three. Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Bring out the ark! The box, the secret weapon. For you see, you remember the ark, right? It's this box that's about 45 inches by 27 inches by 27 inches. Not a, not a really large thing, but inside that box is, is the, 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 the tablets of stone and, and there'd be the Aaron's rod that budded and, and the jar of manna, all holy relics that would, would indeed manifest the very presence of God. And I don't think they believe that the ark is going to save them. They're more sophisticated than that. But perhaps, since it's called here the ark of the covenant, maybe it's the ark that's going to remind the Lord of his covenant. We'll bring this out, and maybe it'll just send a a smoke signal, a little reminder to God that he needs to work on our behalf and defeat Philistines, not defeat us. That's perhaps what they are thinking. So the box would remind the Philistines, or remind God of his covenant. And so they carried out their plan, verses four and five. So the people sent men to Shiloh, about 20 miles, and they brought the ark back to the, of the, sorry, the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is thrown between the cherubim. 
Oh, and uh, Eli's two sons, Hophni, Phinehas, they were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Hmm. So they get so excited that the Ark of God has come that the following verses tell us that they have a, they have a war shout. I mean, they start dancing and having a great cry that indeed God is going to bring them victory. In fact, the cry is so loud that over there in a, few, a mile away, you've got the Philistines who hear the commotion down there. What's the meaning of this outcry, they ask, and they go, oh, the God of Israel, the God who brought the plagues on the Egyptians, that God is, go- is in the camp. Hey, Philistines, let's fight harder. Probably not very smart when you know that the God who sends plagues is going against you, but that's what they do. So everybody's charged up for victory. Israel thinks certainly now they're going to get victory. But in fact, that's not what happens. Israel had two great losses that day. They lost the battle, and they lost the ark. Back to verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated. The the Israelites were defeated. That's not supposed to happen. And every man fled to his his, his tent. The slaughter was so great. In fact, the word there is the plaguing, the plagues that God had brought on Israel. That kind of word is used here. The plagues were so great. It's like a reversal of the Exodus event. The plaguing was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. Now, if you recall earlier, it said about four units of soldiers or 4,000 soldiers. Now you've got 30,000. In other words, now their losses are over seven times worse than they were before when they didn't have the ark. How could this be? Israel defeated. They got whooped. They got slaughtered. They got their tails kicked. They went running for home. But that's not the worst thing. For the worst thing is in verse 11, where the text says, the ark of God was taken. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. You see, in a moment, the entire worship system of Israel at that time is shut down. The ark You know, the ark, the center of Israel's worship system, the ark where God manifested himself, the ark which held the holy relics of Israel, the ark which had the mercy seat in order to bring the forgiveness of Yahweh upon the nation, that ark was taken away. And the priests who ministered at that ark are killed. The worship system of Israel dissolved in a moment. The remainder of this text tells us how tragic it is to lose the ark. How serious it is to lose the presence of God. And we see it in the two events that follow up, two vignettes, a vignette of a death and the vignette of a birth. First of all, because of the loss of the ark, Eli died. We continue our story in verse 12. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there there was Eli uh, sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching, because his heart feared literally on account of the ark of God. He was worried. No, he was trembling because of the ark. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard this, this, this outcry, this voice, and asked, what's the meaning of this uproar? There had been a cry earlier when they thought they'd have victory. Now there was a cry of defeat. The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I've just come from the battlefield. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses, and, and your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are, are dead, and, and, 
And the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man and he was heavy and he had led Israel 40 years. Notice the report. It was not because of the thousands of other deaths on the battlefield that Eli died. It was not because he had lost his his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that Eli died. According to the narrator, it's when he heard the word that the ark of God has been taken. He falls over and he dies. Now, you and I might read this, and we we think it's a little bit odd for them to describe Eli in quite these terms. He was an old man, and he was heavy. A fat old man, of course he died. Ah, Try not to read it through our Western lenses. For indeed to be old is to say that he is a man of great status. Indeed, he is the elder statesman of Israel. He is the channel of glory of God as he ministered with the ark and as he indeed represented God before Israel as their judge. And the word to describe him as heavy is the word kavod. He's a man of glory. So this one who is the primary channel of God's glory (laughs) indeed dies, signaling the death of the glory of God. That's the first vignette. A second vignette that tells of the, the, the nature of this tragedy is in verses 19 through 22. Not a death, but a birth. Continuing on chapter four, verse 19. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured, had been taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, She went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by labor pains. As she was dying, the women attending her said, Don't despair, you've given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father's father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been taken. A time of birth should be a time of such joy, a celebration of life. And here we have this living memorial of one who will be named Ichabod, no glory. It is tragic, for the glory of God has been lost. It's been exiled. How important is the loss of the ark in this text? Five times, five times in just a few verses, it says it's taken. Verse 11, the ark is taken or captured is the way the NIV translates it. 17, it's taken. 19, it's taken. Verse 21, it's taken. Verse 22, it's taken. It's captured. This is not just the loss of some some historic relic or some treasure. It's not not the loss of some box that they really like. This is to demonstrate how important it is to lose the manifestation of the presence of God. Gone. It is a tragedy almost beyond imagination. Imagination. God's still present. He doesn't leave them, but he gives them the cold shoulder. It's as if God is going to say, I will not fight for you, and you will not worship me. His powerful presence is gone. So there's your story. In the midst of their battle, Israel lost God's powerful presence. Why is it there? Why does the author write it like he does? What is he trying to do for his audience? It seems very clear that this is a warning. A warning for God's people. 
a warning that basically says that because they failed to honor God as God, they lost the powerful presence of God. When God's people fail to honor God as God, they risk losing the powerful presence of God. How do we know that? Well, there are several indications in the text that Israel lost God's presence because uh, they didn't honor God as God. Let me give you a couple of broad proofs. First of all, they're involved in manipulating, trying to manipulate God. They bring this ark and they bring it as leverage. They, they, in the process, they trivialize God. They, they act like, like God is not really holy, but in fact, they can do things to make God show up. They tried to manipulate God when they say, bring the ark, verse three, so that God will save us. Now, that's not all unreasonable because in other passages, in other instances, God has actually preceded them into battle with the ark, right? It's the ark that leads them across Jericho, across the Jordan River. It's the ark that will lead them around Jericho. So that's not an unreasonable request. It's the idea that if we have the ark, if we position it just right, if we get it in just the right place and do it the right way, God will bring us victory, cause and effect. Instead of seeing the God who is in control, they saw him as a God they could control. Instead of seeing a big G God, they had a little G God. And they tried to manipulate God. But our God is holy. Our God is above all of that. And he is not so easily leveraged by his people. They tried to manipulate God. That's why I would say they did not honor God as God. There's a second proof within the way this story is told that helps us to see that, that Israel lost the powerful presence of God, that this is a warning because they didn't honor God as God, and it's this. They, they actually failed to honor God as God by complying, complying with evil priests, Hafti and Phineas. You noticed it there, right, when we read the, the ark was brought from Shiloh. They brought it here to the battlefield. And Hophni and Phinehas were there as well. Now, if, you re- if you're a reader of Samuel, you understand that that's not a good thing. These are bad boys. In chapter 2, they're described as wicked men. They are selfish, irreverent, meat takers. Chapter 2, verse 17 says their sin was great that they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. Chapter two, verse 22, said they had sex with women outside the entrance of the tent of meeting. Chapter two, verse 31, a prophet comes and says that they had despised God and that they were cursed and that God would put them to death on the same day. They, then eventually a prophet would come and say because that they had toyed with God and treated him not like the Almighty, but, by something, but as something that they could manipulate for their own gain, Samuel the prophet would come and the first message he's given is to go tell Eli this message. God is going to kill your sons on the same day. They can never be forgiven, he says in chapter 3, verse 11. And in chapter 4, the text says, Samuel's message was heard by all of Israel. This was not a secret. God's going to kill these guys. Now, how foolish is it to have these guys come with the ark to battle? I'm just like inviting a couple of guys with, you know, backpacks full of TNT to come stand next to you while God is throwing lightning bolts. They are marked men. They're trouble with a capital T. This is inviting, inviting disaster. And their guilt indeed will be by association. What the text says is is Israel said, hey, let us take the ark. Israel's, the elders are a group of takers. What's interesting is that same word is what characterizes the actions of these two Hophni and Phinehas back in chapter two. They take meat, they take it for themselves, they take it by force, they take it before it's been sacrificed. 
And now we find, indeed, <laughs> that the elders are going to follow suit and they take the ark. And ultimately, five times, we find out hmm, it's the Philistines who will take the ark. You see, the enemy is not really the Philistines. The enemy started with Hophni and Phinehas. They started the taking. The elders continued the taking. The Philistines finished it off. Indeed, Israel is complicit by being complacent. They approve the sin of this irreverent handling of God's ark. Do not treat holy God as holy and you risk losing the powerful presence of God. That's the warning. So how do we respond to that? What would God have us do? Well, first of all, we recognize that this, this was not just a little issue in Israel. In fact, the warning is going to be extended to the exiles themselves because the last verse here actually says that the glory of God, your NIV translates it, departed. It's literally the word for exiled. The glory of God exiled from Israel. Ezekiel will say the same thing when he talks to the post-exilic community, that the glory of God is exiled. This is a warning for God's people for all time, even ancient Israel, that such action can bring the loss of God's glory. Still true today? Well, I think so. Consider the case of Mars Hill Church. A, a church in Seattle. Uh, our brothers in ministry and sisters in ministry, and, and they had a church that uh, was really bringing glory to God, or so it seemed. A, a church that, at its heights of its power, had sermon downloads of about 260,000 per week. An annual budget of $30 million. Located in Seattle, they actually had 15 satellite locations spread across five different states. Surely they were shining out the glory of God. And it was a year ago this weekend, October 31, that this message was posted on their website. The message read like this. As of January 1, 2015, the existing Mars Hill Church organization will be dissolved. Collapse. Ichabod. Done. How does that happen? Leadership Journey Journal tried to analyze what happened at, at Mars Hill, and they interviewed several pastors and insiders, and what they said was quite interesting. There's a complex of reasons. We don't want to reduce it to some simple reason, but, but a couple of the pastors said things like this. As the church structure became more refined, and I'm quoting one of the pastors, the driving motive became efficiency and growth, and these two factors began dictating church policy. Another pastor put it this way, this all began as a work of the spirit, but we quickly started to push harder and harder, trying to accomplish it with human efforts, bigger, better, faster, stronger. The church wanted to win their battles, so they ended up adopting a business mentality like much of the rest of the city of Seattle in that area. They wanted to be like, like Starbucks and Costco and Microsoft, and one of the pastors said it this way, Seattle is about power, expansion, and world domination. Now, I'm not here to bash our brothers and sisters from a terrible experience they went through. But it gives us the opportunity to recognize that when God is not treated as God, his powerful presence can be lost. It still happens today. We don't want that for us. How do we preserve the powerful presence of God? How, how, how do we protect this blessing 
so that we might not go down such a sad, tragic route. Perhaps a couple things that we can do to indeed honor God as God. In our preaching, boy, it's so easy, isn't it, to, to emphasize our techniques, to emphasize our skills, to begin to think if I just preach the right way and do it a certain, with a certain intonation and do it with a certain kind of style, that, that God has to work and bring victory. Careful, careful. Honor God as God in our preaching. Or perhaps in, in, our, in our, our outreach. Oh, it would be so easy to think that if I can just get the brochures designed right, if we can have a website that really grabs people's attention. You know, if, if people walk in the door and they get what they need with their coffee and their donuts and whatever it takes, we want people to feel so welcome and so comfortable and God will have to work. Careful, careful. Those may not be bad things, but they can so replace the honor of God as God. We don't want that. It could be that even in our worship, the Lord's table, it becomes mechanical and rote. Just something we do. And we could even stand in front of people and ask for the blessing on bread and the blessing on the cup and miss the honor of God. We want better. Honor God as God and we protect, preserve this wonderful blessing of his presence with us. <laughs> that morning when two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning when my alarm went off. I jumped out of bed, <laughs> ran down the stairs. My heart was racing 150 beats a minute. It was a false alarm. Somehow the wind had blown open our front door and there was not an intruder, just the wind. But I was still glad that I had that alarm. My friends, this is not a false alarm. May God help us spring into action so that we might preserve the blessing of his presence, his powerful presence. And so, our Father, we confess to you that we are quick to turn to our own devices. Forgive us, I pray, when we try to take matters into our hands and we trivialize you. And yet, Father, we're encouraged because we know that as we heed this warning, as we do honor you, you do show up and you fight your battles and you bring us victory. Draw us close to yourself, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.